Uh, Professor Barry Wynn came from Sohar University, Oman, and uh, he's, he'll be talking about uh, the emergence of Middle East as a coveted knowledge destination, and he would share his ideas or however, it, uh, however he wishes to. The panelist, uh, Professor Ghassan, is not present here. Okay, salam alaikum. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm currently Vice Chancellor of Sohar University um, in Oman, about two hours here. Uh, from, from the border, and uh, I'm a panel of one here, so uh, I, I'll, I can make some observations and very happy to take questions. Um, I've spent most of my career in the, in the United Kingdom, and uh, I would give some observations uh, from that particular standpoint. Although I have been in Oman about a year, and I've traveled extensively around the world doing partnerships, um, and I'll talk about our experience in uh, this part of the world, specifically Oman and, what, and what's needed. I'm going to give a slightly different view of UK education to what you heard earlier today. I'm much more optimistic. And uh, I, I think uh, UK education is some of the best in the world. And things have changed rapidly. Um, but back in 1963, we had a, a, just before he was Prime Minister, Harold Wilson used the phrase, the white heat of technology. And what he recognized then was that we needed educated people, we needed people who were able after the world wars, we needed a skilled population to grow our country. And he started the Open University, which was a distance learning university, and he said it was one of his proudest achievements. Now I mentioned Harold Wilson, I was at the University of Bradford as Deputy Vice Chancellor until about a year ago, and Harold Wilson had been our Chancellor for many years, he was the first Chancellor of that university. But the thing he wanted to do was he wanted to open education to more and he wanted to provide technological uh, education for, for the UK. So back in the 1980s, 1950s and 60s, you heard, to, uh, you've seen some slides earlier today showing success rates. When I was a student in the 70s, less than 5% of people went to university. It was a very elitist occupation. But we needed to grow that enormously. So by 19... Sorry, currently, they're over 50% of people 18 years old go to university. But the key is the diversity of mission. We need different types of university to serve our need. And that's particularly relevant here in the Middle East. I think in a latest league table, Caltech was voted the best, or sorry, ranked as the best university in the world. And it's a very, very fine institution. But if every university in the world was like Caltech, it wouldn't serve our needs. We need a diversity of mission. We need to um, be involved in different aspects of education to support industry, to support cultural and social economic growth. So from the UK point of view, the failing sector that I heard earlier, I don't think it is a failing sector. Only 0.8% of the world's population are in the United Kingdom. Yet on the scientific indices of citations, the UK has 12% of the world's citations. So we massively punch above our weight. We have the highest number of citations per academic in the world, beating the USA. We also have the highest number of academic papers in the world, beating the USA per academic. But the USA has some of the best universities in the world because it's very big, 350 million people and some very, very fine institutions. And I mention that because in the Middle East, we've got to be careful that we don't try and compete with universities that have been gone a very long time. Some of them have got a 500-year head start on us in some parts of the world. So what is it that we need here that will make us different, will give us that competitive advantage? And I think yesterday what I heard was Oxford and Cambridge, I could just say, started off, they actually done theology and natural philosophy. And when the Industrial Revolution happened in engineering, they didn't want to do engineering. It was deemed to be a bit of a dirty business and nobody would want that. It's not an academic pursuit. So a new tranche of universities started who would do en en engineering, medicine, other types of activity. And of course, that's now become mainstream. And then we move on again, and we needed a new set of universities, and we needed polytechnics. So all the time, the university sector has developed and emerged. So if we simply try to replicate what the ancient universities of the world do, we will probably fail. So I think the key is to think of how we take a leap over and create a university that's fit for purpose now. So I'm in the second university in Oman. We were the first private university, but we're only 15 years old. 
So I'll just touch on this public-private sector thing, because it, it does sort of get people agitated, I think, and when I come to meetings like this. We, we our private sector, our money, uh, two money guys who, who have made their money in business and they've invested in their home city. They've got a royal decree from His Majesty Sultan Qaboos, and they've built a world-class campus. We've just opened a $60 million library on our campus, so um, massive investment. Our students are funded by scholarships from the government, so our revenue is public sector, the infrastructure is private sector, they're not taking money out. If I look at Western universities, from my point of view, I was in the UK a long time, so this is me, poacher turned gamekeeper. Many British universities would be in deficit if it was not for international student numbers. They brought student numbers in. They franchise student numbers overseas. You'll find you can get British degrees all over the world. Serial franchising. And the quality wasn't always good, and it was a financial driver. It was not about transnational education for many. And if you go to the Quality Assurance Agency website in the UK, you'll get independent reviews of that. It's a very transparent system. You can find out. Someone mentioned earlier, I think, um, uh, sorry, you mentioned earlier about transnational education in this looking at different jurisdictions and learning from each other and, tr and moving knowledge both ways. That's the key. So in Soho, we're a young university, but we want to be a progressive, modern, outward-looking university that engages with business. We don't do philosophy. We, we've got six faculties. We do engineering, private university. We're not doing the cheap stuff. We're doing engineering, which is expensive, computer science, business, languages, arts, education, law. We're a broad provider. And we're there to make a difference in Oman. So we will not feature on any league table because league tables are driven by citations, a very Western view of how league tables are generated because there's a set of values that they've migrated. And I've worked in a number of universities in, in, in the West, and they're very good institutions, and I'm very proud of working there. But if I look at the impact my current university makes on our community, it is enormous. 80% of our students are women. They're making their own life choices now. They're starting to think about how they move forward. It's had an enormous effect. They're getting into business. 50% of our engineering students are women. So how do I move the university forward? So if I was looking at the Middle East in general, or many international universities around in, here in Dubai, um, some have committed by putting campuses here. But I think when I look at the academic staff we hire, there's a sense of the Middle East has been a consumer of education. So I meet people who've got three master's degrees. I don't know how many you need. Three seems too many to me. At some point, you've got to get out, and, get out there and do something. But lots of master's degrees. They've got maybe one PhD. And they've been around the world consuming education and bringing it back. If you get a PhD in the US, you might get a postdoc position. Then you might get a faculty position. And you might become an autonomous researcher. What tends to happen here is if you get a PhD, you could be the assistant dean of a faculty or the dean of a faculty very, very quickly. So what we've got to try and do now is instead of being a consumer of education, is use those skills, work with international partners, and become a creator of knowledge. We've got to create our own knowledge so people come to this destination because you can do something here that you can't do in London or you can't do in New York. And that's what we're trying to forge. Now, we need help with that, and we're working in partnership. And partnership is a big deal for us. We've been looked after by the University of Queensland for many years. They helped us from our inception, and they still work with us. But it has to be a reciprocal arrangement. There has to be something in it for the University of Queensland, who are a world top 100 university. They will let their corporate social responsibility run for a certain amount of time, but it won't last forever. So just as an example, I was in Brisbane in November. The petrochemical industry in Australia is starting to collapse. There's not many places. They have world-class chemical engineering at the uh, University of Queensland. They can't get their students placed now in the petrochemical industry in Australia. It doesn't exist. But they have a partner in Sahar, and we live lots, next to lots of petrochemical industry. We live next to plastics and all sorts of industry. We're bringing Australian students to Oman to do internships, to work in industries, to work here. So that's part of what we can do for them. They will then bring an academic expertise to help us grow to help us support, to help us create knowledge. So we're working in that way. The other thing that we're trying to do, um, I'm working with the University of Sheffield. So one of the, it's a, one of the world top 100 universities. It's extremely good at advanced manufacturing. It works with Boeing, Rolls-Royce, major companies. These companies want to get into the Middle East. They want a base here. They want to think of how we can do it. So when I looked at Oman, 
And I looked at how we create a life after oil. What do we do? So at the moment in, in my city, big port, massive port, we have um, oil. We bring in iron ore from Brazil. We put it in a big furnace. We make steel and we export it to China. We have an aluminium smelter. We make aluminium, we make ingots, and we send it to China. We make plastics. So we do lots of things and we export. What we need to do is we need to create downstream value to get an industry in Oman which can manufacture. There are 400 million people in MENA, all potential consumers. It's easier to make things if you've got the capability in the city. So what I'm doing with Sheffield is we want to set up an advanced manufacturer research center in a manufacturing park in Sohar, and we will build capability, and we will, we will de-risk investment for international companies who want to be based in the Middle East. And that's a real key to us. We will have Sheffield academics coming to work with us, and we will have PhDs working in Oman, but registered in Sheffield. They will do their work with us, but they will get a Sheffield PhD. They will visit Sheffield, but they will do in-country research. We will build capability. So the partnership is absolutely key. So the assets for us in this region, we are in a politically stable region. It's very welcoming to Western businesses. Very difficult for Americans to go to Iran. They're difficult for me to go to Iran. Pakistan is difficult, rather sadly, at the moment. There are difficult areas around the region. This is a good place to do business. We need to build a capability, but we can create knowledge. We can do something a bit different here. And being close to business is actually a very valuable thing. So that's part of our way forward. So in terms of the partnership, to become creators of knowledge, um, I've got a few R's here that will help. I know this doesn't translate into Arabic, but uh, reciprocity. There has to be an advantage for the partners. There has to be two-way knowledge exchange. We are the junior partner. Our academic profile isn't as strong as these partners I'm talking about, but all our staff have PhDs, so they've got the capability. We need to grow. The international partners will help us grow. We need to be responsive. We need to be flexible of the needs of business, but flexible to the needs of our partners. We also need to work to make external agencies more flexible and more accommodating. I was talking to uh, a senior academic from Hult just this morning. We were talking about the American Accreditation for Business Schools, AACSB. It's a club. If they use the metrics for the US and they use the metrics, those same metrics in Oman, they'll never get a member. They need to be flexible and understand the opportunities and the economic development in this part of the world. So we need to work with these agencies to say, we've got quality, you need to think about how you do it. We also need to be realistic. We need to understand it's about the art of the possible. We need to take small steps and make progress. So last week I was at a conference in Alain, run by the Times Higher, and an American colleague from Harvard actually said, he asked the question in the Middle East, what about academic freedom? And what about political freedom? He asked, you know, the questions that you'd expect. So I posed back to him, George W. Bush, when he was president, would not allow federal funding to be used for stem cell research because the right wing of America didn't want it. So the academic breadth there was diminished. Academic freedom did not happen. But it's difficult sometimes for Americans to realize that there are, they have boundaries too. The boundaries are difficult, and we've got to make small steps. So yes, there are constraints in every society, and we have to work. But we have to look, if we're doing something for the greater good, there will be a benefit. And I think that's what we're trying to do. The other thing when partnership, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be sustainable. And very often, vice chancellors go around the world, and we sign MOUs with partners, and we leave the country, and we never think about it again. And we put the MOU in, in, in a drawer, and we get a bit of PR saying, I've signed an MOU. You've got to get the partnerships out of the vice chancellor's office. They only do ceremonial things. I speak for myself. You've got to get it to people who matter. You've got to get it project-based. You've got to get it to people who are prepared to get their hands dirty, to make a difference, student exchange. You've got to be driven. You've got to have a champion for it and get it out of the office. And then finally, the issue of reputational damage. We get reflected glory by working with world top 100 universities. We have to be sure that we don't hurt them. Similarly, if they come here, we have to be sure that they're not going to impinge on our rights and freedoms also in, in Oman. So that's quite, quite a number of hours there. But if we do that, I think the partnerships uh, are really key. Now, just from a more academic point of view, 
We hear a lot about universities have to get students ready for employment. And I heard at this conference that 65% of our graduates, the jobs don't exist any yet. So what are we getting them ready for? We've got to get them ready for life. We've got, to tr we've got to educate them, not train them for a job. We've got to educate them so they've got the skills to start lifelong learning, to start moving forward. And I come to a lot of these conferences, and I always hear about this golden age where employers were happy with graduates. Now, I'm getting a little bit gray in the hair here. Uh, I, I can go back 30 years. I can tell you, employers have never been happy with graduates. They've always said, our job isn't to get them ready. And someone yesterday said, they're a weak induction, but they don't want six months. The employers have got a responsibility for their business to train people. It's not about being ready. So again, if I talk from a UK perspective where the fees now are high, there are three beneficiaries in the UK of higher education. There's the individual, changes their life. There's the taxpayer, we have a civilized society and we have skills. And there's business. And currently, students pay, the taxpayer pays, but businesses have been very slow. Businesses don't contribute. Now, I don't mind that too much, as long as when they get graduates, they're prepared to put training on for them. So I don't believe in the golden age. The other thing I don't believe in is that students were better 20 years ago. I meet with students all the time. I walk across our campus in Oman. A lot of young women, excited, enthusiastic. They want to learn. They're there for a reason. And when I'm in the UK, I meet students on campus all the time. It changes people's lives. Education, universities have the power to change people's lives. We've got an important role in the world. So I don't go back 20 years and, and, uh, or 30 years and think, oh, the graduates are better. I don't think they were. I think what's happened is we've got more technology. We've got access to resources. We're better at materials. The audits have worked. We now look at each other. We've got peer observation. We've raised the standards. So this is not quite, a, this is not probably the right anecdote, but let me, last year in the UK, more people passed their driving test than ever before. Lots more than passed 30 years ago. Has the driving test got easier? It's actually got harder. It's now got a written test and a, and, a, and a test where you drive. But we put more training in. We help people get through. We do a lot more. So I think, in the, certainly in the British system, over the last 30 years, the exams, we used to set exams to find out what people didn't know. So they failed. And what we now do is we try and do things. So we try and find out what people do know, because what people know is the important thing. So it's been a fundamental shift. And I think... Uh, we've got to have faith in our students. We've got to have faith uh, that they will uh, make a big contribution. In Oman, my final point, in 1970, when His Majesty Sultan Qaboos uh, took over, there were no schools in Oman. People didn't go to school. Within one year, he had schools. We've only got, we had, in, 90, in sorry, year 2000, we were the second university. So things have moved rather quickly and dramatically, and what a difference that has made. So he put his faith in the youth of Oman to lead the nation forward beyond oil. And we have to um, honor that commitment and that trust that he put. And we have to build universities that are fit for our world, that are fit and will move forward and draw people in because they can do something in Sahar University that they can't do uh, in other places. So um, there's lots to do. There are lots of great partners. You should pick your partners carefully, and you should work for mutual benefit. Um, it's an exciting time to be in the Middle East, and I think we can make a real difference. So, you know, please, uh, if anything, I'd say keep the faith. <laughs> we do a good job. And uh, the, the, I think in uh, Dubai, with the number of international providers here, there's a real opportunity to work closely with those uh, international agencies to raise the standards, but to create knowledge, and that would be my final part. Let's get to a region where we just don't consume education, but we can be creators of knowledge and we make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Professor Wynne from Sohar University is the Vice Chancellor, and I would request uh, Mr. Raghav to give away the memento to Professor Wynne. I'm very glad that you came from Sohar. I spent eight years of my life in knowledge versus Muscat. I was working there in Oman. I'm glad there is someone from Oman here. Thank you very much, sir.